So welcome to Introductory Ecology. Um, for each lecture, um, I'm going to be providing um, a video version of the lecture to kind of work as, a, as an extra study tool. So I'll just release these videos in the lead up to exams. So they don't replace uh, the lectures themselves, they're kind of abridged versions, but they do um, contain most of the information that's going to be on so this, in this introduction lecture, I'm going to start, I'm going to cover the following things. So first we're going to define ecology, what is ecology. Then we're going to start to try and understand the range of questions that are asked by ecologists and the range of methods that they use to ask these questions. Um, then finally, we're going to outline the scientific method um, and learn to apply it, to apply it, sorry, in ecological context. So first, what is ecology? Well, ecology is the study of relationships between organisms and the environment. Um, when we think of ecology, I think most people probably think of um, work that's being done in, in natural areas like this. And of course, um, it does encompass that. Increasingly, though, um, ecology is a very human science. This is the, the high line in, in Manhattan. Um, and this is the kind of innovation that we, we're seeing more and more of because ecologists are being asked to be involved um, in city planning and things like this. So using cities um, as a bridge for um, organisms between natural areas, but also creating more livable spaces for humans um, are all things that um, ecologists are concerned with. So the kinds of questions that ecologists um, approach um, occur over a huge range of spatial and temporal scales. So in terms of um, spatial scales, uh, this figure illustrates that quite nicely. This is a kind of hierarchy, a hierarchy um, of uh, ecology, so different levels of ecological systems. So at the bottom we have the ecology of organisms, that's something we call orticology. Above that we have populations, which we'll spend more time on uh, during this course. So above that, we have communities. So this is groups of populations interacting uh, in a given area. So above that, we have ecosystems. So there are multiple communities occurring um, over a wider area. And in these kinds of spaces, ecologists are, are more concerned with answering, answering questions about things like energy flux and the cycling of nutrients. And then at the top level, we have um, the biosphere, so ecologists that are working on global processes. So as well as uh, spatial scales, um, ecologists ask questions on a, a wide range of temporal scales as well. So just to give a few um, examples of that, um, the huge leaves that you can see on the, the plant on the left hand side um, are from a plant in the, the family Aeraceae, and they're found often um, on the floors of tropical forests. So the leaves are huge because uh, they're not exposed to, to high levels of sunlight because they're covered by the canopy above. And the sunlight that they do receive tends to come in the form of little flecks that come through the canopy as trees move above them. And so ecologists can ask questions like, how does a, a, a fleck of light that might last a single second affect rates of photosynthesis in the leaf? And so we can use uh, machines like this LICOR machine on the right that measures gas exchange in the leaf to look at rates of photosynthesis over periods as, as short as one second. So this is an example of an ecological question that's occurring over a, a period of time uh, that's a matter so by way of comparison, this is um, a study from your, or an example from your textbooks. Um, it describes a, a study conducted by Bennett in 1983. Um, and he was interested in uh, the colonisation of tree species um, in a region in Great Britain after glaciation. So the way he studied that was by looking at uh, the deposition of pollen grains in soil sediments. Um, so he could take a core of soil and look at the, uh, the densities of pollen grains of different species in different layers of that, that soil core. What he found uh, was that 
um, a particular species of tree, Scotch pine, um, had colonized Great Britain 9,500 years ago. And then he could even, by looking at the density of pollen grains, he could look at or he could estimate population growth within that species. And he found that the population had grown exponentially for 500 years. So this is an example of an experiment that, that looks at a question that spans periods of, of hundreds or thousands of years. And indeed, when we think about paleobotanists, or people who study uh, plant fossils, we can ask questions um, that are relevant or stretch back over millions of years. So there's this huge uh, range of uh, temporal scales on which ecologists work. So the kinds of techniques and methods used by ecologists to ask their questions or answer their questions also vary massively um, in their complexity. And this is an example of a really simple uh, study um, conducted by Robert MacArthur, who studied warblers in American spruce forests. What he noticed was, was that there were a large number of warbler species that were feeding on insects in the same trees. And he wondered why um, or how those species were able to coexist when they were all competing for seemingly the same resources. And just by with a, staring at these trees with a pair of binoculars, um, he determined that these warbler birds were all um, foraging for insects um, in slightly different parts of the trees. So, for example, the Cape May warbler uh, likes to forage right in the, the top of the trees. Uh, the yellow rumped warbler tends to forage at the base of the trees. Uh, the black throated warbler tends to feed more in the, the internal branches of trees, whereas other species like the, the black Burnian warbler um, seem to forage just on the outer branches of trees. And so this is a phenomenon known as niche partitioning. So these species are all able to coexist uh, within a habitat by, by kind of separating their niches and foraging for food in slightly different ways. So again, to kind of compare this really simplistic uh, method that just involved watching birds with binoculars, um, we can see the kind of complexity of methods used in this study by Ryan Norris who used stable isotopes to understand the feeding habits of migratory birds. So I'll start by just explaining what stable isotopes are. So uh, this is obviously a picture of the, the periodic table. And within each element, you can see this, uh, the number at the bottom, um, so it's the carbon, it's 12.011. This is the atomic mass um, of the element. Um, and the reason it's not a whole number is because there are several different isotopes of that element with different numbers of neutrons. So in the case of carbon, um, carbon has three isotopes, carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Carbon-12 and carbon-13 are stable isotopes because they don't undergo radioactive decay. And so they stay present in samples um, for longer or indefinitely. Carbon-14 does decay um, radioactively, so it's not a stable isotope. So within samples, over long periods of time, the proportion of carbon-14 would decrease. So ecologists uh, actually use stable isotopes to study a, a whole range of questions. Um, but I'll describe this example um, of Ryan Norris using them to, uh, to um, understand uh, feeding habits in the American red star. So these birds... Um, breed in North America, but then they migrate to wintering sites um, in warmer climates, so in Central and South America. Um, the question that Ryan Norris wanted to ask was, how does um, the habitat use of these birds in their wintering sites affect their reproductive success when they get back to their, their breeding sites in North America? So, for example, uh, it's known that in Jamaica, these American red starts will feed in two different habitats mainly. So more productive mangrove habitats that you can see on the bottom and then kind of uh, less productive scrub habitats that you can see um, above. So the plants in these habitats and the insects within them that the, the red starts feed on um, contain different ratios of these different carbon isotopes. 
And so those um, ratios of isotopes then become present in the red starts that are fed on those insects. And so we can, scientists can base themselves in North America and by taking blood samples from these birds, we can tell whether those birds have been feeding in the mangrove habitats or in the scrubland. So it's much easier to conduct experiments to look at the effects of those feeding habitats on uh, reproductive fitness, for example, because we don't need to observe a particular bird as it feeds and then migrates um, across oceans. Uh, we can understand certain behaviours of that bird just by uh, taking a blood sample and looking at the ratios of those different isotopes. So another example of an experiment that was conducted on a huge spatial scale was this one by Dave Schindler, who wanted to understand the cause of eutrophication. So eutrophication um, occurs when chemicals get leached into water bodies. And as a result, we see these devastating um, blooms of green algae. So this kind of sudden proliferation of green algae can obviously have devastating impacts on other organisms in the lake. Um, and so it's important that we understand the root cause of you. So uh, Dave Schindler utilized this, um, this region of lakes in Ontario called the experimental lake area, where he could inoculate whole lakes uh, with different combinations of chemicals. So in the image on the right, you can see a huge lake that's divided into two sections. The bottom section was fertilized with carbon and nitrogen only and the top section was fertilized with carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And you can see that this eutrophication phenomenon has occurred only in the top lake. And so Dave Schindler used this to understand that phosphorus is the key chemical when it comes to causing eutrophication um, in lakes like this. But another thing this experiment does is it, uh, it highlights the importance of experimental scale. So, while Dave Schindler was conducting this experiment, many people were, were trying to also get to the bottom of eutrophication by conducting small-scale experiments in the lab. So they would take beakers full of lake water and mix in different combinations of chemicals as um, Dave Schindler did. The difference, as it turned out, was that in a windswept lake, that lake water exchanges a lot of CO2 and nitrogen with the atmosphere. And so that CO2 absorbed by the lake continues to fuel photosynthesis uh, in these um, photosynthetic algae. And that exchange of CO2 and nitrogen with the air doesn't happen in a small beaker. And so um, the effects of um, introducing different levels of, uh, of nutrients into, into to a beaker uh, were completely different to doing a similar thing at the level of a lake. So this graph does a really good job of just explaining um, or depicting the different spatial and temporal scales that ecologists work on. So for example, an ecologist who's working on um, CO2 transport in leaves might conduct experiments that last very short periods of time and occur over very, sh very small spaces. A scientist who's looking at um, populations of annual plants will conduct experiments that last roughly a year and tend to be done over kind of intermediate spaces. Finally, at the other end of the spectrum, scientists who are looking at things like paleobotany um, or climate change or continental drift will conduct experiments that occur over long, long periods of time, so multiple years, and occur over huge spaces, maybe encompassing the entire globe. So I want to finish this, uh, this video by talking about the scientific method. So the scientific method is about um, engaging in a constant circle of observation, speculation, hypothesis, and experimentation. So we make observations in the field, and in response to the things that we observe, um, we speculate and we formulate questions. And those questions have to have testable hypotheses. So um, we conduct experiments that test those hypotheses, and really what we're trying to do is disprove those hypotheses. Off the back of those experiments, we de decide whether we can accept or reject our, our hypothesis. Um, and if we reject it, we reevaluate re our observations, 
um, and our theory. And if we accept the hypothesis, um, we see if we can reproduce those results. And if we can, we make more predictions and we, we conduct further experiments in order to develop that theory. So in class, we talked a little bit about um, examples of using uh, the experimental or, or the scientific method in the context of ecology. So here's one quick example. So um, this is a, a plant called a butterfly pea. Um, it's pollinated by bumblebees, but it suffers damage um, by flies um, who suck on the petals um, and blister beetles who actually eat parts of the petals. And the question we might ask is, does damage to these flowers affect visitation rates from the bees? And ultimately, does it affect uh, success of pollination? So we can then conduct an experiment that looks at visitation rates of bumblebees um, in flowers uh, that have been that have been suffered uh, damage from these different insects. So the bars on the left are flowers that are damaged by blister beetles in two different sites. Then the middle two bars are are flowers that were damaged by flies and then the two bars on the right are control flowers that didn't suffer any, any damage and what you can see is significantly greater uh, level of visitation um, by bees on undamaged flowers. So when we conduct these experiments we need to back them up statistically so you can see the letters above the bars indicate significant differences between those uh, visitation rates in those two damaged flowers um, compared to visitation rates in the control undamaged flowers. So I want to leave you with a few important quotes about science. Uh, Karl Popper um, said that it, an experiment is an attempt to falsify a, a hypothesis. So when we, um, when we generate hypotheses, we generate a null hypothesis and what's called an alternative hypothesis, which is what we, we expect to happen. And really what we're doing when we conduct experiments is trying to falsify that alternative hypothesis. Carl Sagan said that the method of science is far more important than the findings of science. Um, and the more and more you get involved in science and conduct experiments, the more true you realise that quote to be. Um, the best tools available uh, to us cannot be used to answer questions that are poorly framed. And so I've talked a lot about um, ingenious methods that scientists have used to, um, to approach ecological questions during this video. Um, but none of those, um, those scientific approaches are any good if we don't formulate good scientific questions. So what is science? Science is really a way of knowing. And what good scientific theories do for us is they allow us to make predictions. And there are no better theories than Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, and Darwin, um, when he was in Madagascar, observed these um, Star of David orchids, or what are now known as Darwin's orchids, that have these huge uh, nectar tubes. Um, so the nectar in these flowers are right at the bottom of these huge tubes. Darwin made the prediction that in Madagascar uh, there must be an insect with a really, really long proboscis uh, that would enable them to feed on nectar from these flowers. And lo and behold, 40 years after Darwin's death, uh, this subspecies of African hawk moth uh, was discovered in Ma Madagascar with this huge long proboscis allowing it to feed on nectar from these flowers. 